Okay, so we have looked at a bunch of ways to achieve multitasking in Node.js. We know the problem and we have looked at different solutions to solve that problem. Starting with child processes, we moved on to the cluster module. Then we looked at PM2, which made it easier for us to manage our child processes. In the last couple of videos, we looked at worker threads. In this video, we'll look at the worker pool. It's a third party library that offers an easy way to create workers dynamically. The basic idea behind this worker pool is to spawn a bunch of workers right away. There's going to be a task queue that will contain all the user requests. These spawned workers are going to pick up tasks from this queue one by one and resolve them independently. This pattern is called the thread pool pattern. The best part about this library is that it runs in Node.js as well as modern browsers. So you can use a worker pool to manage web workers when you are working on the front end. On the back end, you can manage both worker threads as well as child processes. So basically you are dealing with a very versatile library that can do a lot of things. So let's see how we can implement this inside Node.js. So I have a Node.js application here with Express installed. I also have these two endpoints here. So there's a light endpoint and there's a heavy endpoint. If you have watched any of the videos from the series, I'm sure you'll be familiar with them. The first endpoint is fairly straightforward. Anytime you get a request on this endpoint is going to resolve it right away. The second endpoint has some blocking code in it. So the heavy endpoint here does a complex calculation. This complex calculation is from this function. It's a simple while loop which is going to iterate this many times. So this is going to block the event loop which will subsequently block any other requests. Let me just quickly run this. Now I have the heavy request here and the light request here. I'll hit the heavy request first and then I'll try to hit the light request. You'll see that the light request is also taking some time even though it should have resolved right away. So this is what I was talking about. The heavy request is going to block the event loop and in turn it's going to block any subsequent requests. Now let's add the worker pool to this application and try to fix this problem. We'll have to first install the worker pool library. So let me do that. npm install worker pool. Okay, once this is done, I'll import the library as well. So, all right, so the first step now is to create a pool of workers. You can do this by using the pool method from the worker pool library. So I'll create an instance, I'll call it pool and worker pool dot pool. This pool method can take two optional arguments. The first argument is a path to a file. So if you pass in a file, this file will be started by a worker. So if you watch my previous video on worker threads, you will remember that we can spawn a worker in a different file as well. We can do it in the same file, but we can have a separate file to run our worker code. So this is exactly what the first argument is going to do. If you don't pass in anything as the first argument, it's just going to spawn a worker by default. And then eventually you can use the worker in the future to offload some tasks to it. We will look at that later. Now the second argument is an options object. It has a couple of configurations that you can use to set up your worker pool. For instance, minimum or maximum number of workers that you'll need in your worker pool or maybe max queue size, which limits the total number of tasks your queue can hold. You can also specify the type of workers you're working with. So we have four options. The first option is auto, which is going to automatically decide the worker type based on the environment that you're working in. So web will be for browser environments, process will be for child processes and thread will be for worker threads. There are two other options called folk arguments or folk options which can only be used when the worker type is set to process. You can pass in a bunch of arguments or options to the fork process using these options. For now, let's just keep it empty. We'll create a simple worker pool instance with no configurations. Now inside the heavy endpoint, instead of running the calculation directly, we'll offload it to the worker in the worker pool. To do that, we use the exec method on the pool instance, which takes the complex calculation either as a string or as a function. So let me just do that pool dot exec is going to take in the complex calculation. 
This is the first argument. Now the second optional argument is a list of arguments for the function that we just passed inside the exec method. So since our complex calculation function has no arguments, we can ignore the second argument. Keep in mind that these functions are serialized and then passed to the worker. So if you have a large function or if your function arguments are huge, it could take a toll on the performance. This exec method returns a promise. So you can use a callback function to check whether the calculation is done or if there was an error. So I'll just simply console log the result directly. And I'll also look for errors in case if there are any. At the end, it's good practice to terminate these workers when they're done with their work. So we'll be adding that as well. I won't be needing this anymore and I'll be sending the response over here. Now let me just go through our example once again. I'll need to run the app. Now if I try to make a heavy request first, let me do that. And now if I run the light request, this resolves right away. So if I hit it multiple times, it's not being blocked by the heavy request. So Essentially, the heavy request is offloaded to a worker and hence the event loop is not blocked anymore. So this is the most basic implementation of a worker pool. Now going back to the pool method, I mentioned earlier that you can pass in a path to a file as the first argument and the spawned worker will run this file. Let's try to do it that way. We need to first create the worker file. So let's create that. I'll call it worker.js. This file will have the complex calculation function, so I'll copy it from the app file. At the end, we create the worker by using the worker method on the worker pool instance. So first I'll need to import that. So basically this method is going to create a worker and store it inside the worker pool. And we can pass in all the methods that we need as part of this worker. So I'll be adding the complex calculation method. It needs to be part of an object. Now if we go back to the main file, now we'll need to add the path of the file over here. So I'll just add it worker.js. Then inside the exec method, we'll have to convert this into a string because it's referring the worker instance created in the worker file. We don't really have a method to refer to in this file, so we need to do that. Now if I run this, you'll see that it works as expected. It's going to work pretty much the same as we saw earlier. It resolves right away. This worker pool instance also has a method called stats, which you can use to gain some statistical insights on your worker pool. I'll add a console log statement before the complex calculation and one after the operation. So right below this. Now if I save this and make a request to the heavy endpoint, you'll see this first. So this is the console log on line number 13. It's giving you the stats related to your pool total number of workers, busy workers, idle workers, spending tasks and active tasks. Now once the operation was done, you will see the total number of workers count went up by one and the idle workers count also went up by one. So this means that the operation is done. One worker was used to do that operation and now it is idle. If I add one more console log statement after the termination, and run this. Let me make the request. Okay, so the first time I get this object, no workers, no busy workers, no idle workers. So this statement is from line number 13. Once the execution is done, you will get a different set. So the second object is from line number 16. So it's giving you the statistical information right after execution. Now the third object here is from the line number 22 console log statement. 
So now you can see that the worker count is again set to zero because we reset the pool. Now the last thing that we'll be taking a look at is events. You can send data back from workers to the pool while the task is being executed using the worker emit function. So inside our calculation function, I'll be sending two messages, one before the while loop and one after the while loop. So for that, I'll need to use the worker pool dot worker emit function. To listen to these messages inside our pool dot exec method, we can pass in an object with the on event. So the second argument that we had looked at was the number of arguments that we can pass to this function. In our case, there are no arguments, so I'll just pass in an empty array. And after that, I'll pass in an object which is going to have an on method. This on method is an event listener for any messages that I get from the worker emit function that we have over here. This callback function can do anything you want, but but for now, I'll just console log the messages that I'm getting from the worker file. So console.log message. Now, if I go back and make a request to the heavy endpoint, you can see that the worker will now start the calculation message was sent. So this line got executed. Now, after the calculation is done, we'll get this message as well. Yeah, you can see the message over here. So that's how you can send messages from the worker file to the pool using the worker emit method. And yeah, that's about it for this video. It's a pretty straightforward library that you can use to manage your workers. I'll most probably make a video on web workers eventually in the future. Then we'll see how you can use the library on the browser as well. So do subscribe for that. You can go check out this library on the NPM registry. It's very well documented and heavily used in the Node.js community. This video is the final part of the multitasking series. So if you have any doubts or suggestions, do put them in the comments and yeah, I'll see you in the next one.